co-host option? <laughs> okay. Yes, there is. All right. Uh, again, thank you and welcome to uh, the Death Scene Investigations with Christopher Kay. Uh, we're very excited to have this presentation today uh, from an expert um, in the in the field um, that uh, he'll be able to obviously share a lot of that information and where he comes from. But the um, you know the main thing when you hear about somebody who's interested in criminal justice, typically it tends towards solving crimes, right? So with death scene investigations, um, we're definitely excited to see the behind the scenes of so how do we go? How do people go about really? doing this investigation um, to determine the who done it or what happened and, and things like that. So certainly very excited to have this and be able to offer it to the community of people who are interested in criminal justice. This is part of our criminal justice week of, of webinars. Um, we're, we're very excited about the program at the campus. In fact, um, during this week only, we are offering a tremendous discount um, on the program itself. Uh, for people who are kind of on the fence, have been thinking um, this is their week and their opportunity to take advantage of that um, scholarship that's, uh, that ends after this week. So um, after the uh, presentation is done, if somebody wants more information about that, certainly um, I can make those arrangements and get those in, that information to you. If you're watching the recording of this, um, you'll just want to reach out to us um, on our campus. Um, on our campus phone number and I'll put that up or I'll mention it here at the end um, or even just emailing myself to uh, uh, to get more information on that but anyways uh, going back to this uh, we're, again we're very excited I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, what Chris presents today um, and I will turn it over to him and I'll see you guys as soon as uh, he's done I'll take it back over well thank you guys can everybody hear me okay Hopefully, I, my yes. mic's working perfectly. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody coming. Uh, I, I threw together a, a shorter version of a PowerPoint that's been kind of continually working uh, for a very long time uh, at this point, but I'm excited to share uh, my perspective and experience about medical legal death investigation, um, and mainly because uh, essentially in the criminal justice world it's a bridge between science and law enforcement and it's something that not a lot of people are aware of even or know much about uh, so for me you know as, as a, a former death investigator with Pima County you know it's it's fantastic that I get to share this information so my experience um, with death investigation um, has been, you know, a life-changing experience ultimately, and I, you know, I'm, I feel lucky to have been in the field as well. I was actually introduced to medical legal death investigation through a PowerPoint presentation, ironically enough, um, early in my uh, during my bachelor's program, and I knew that's kind of what I want. That was going to be my goal um, from the moment I saw the first slide. So. Hopefully, it'll be at least some informative information and something to consider, um, but it also can lead to other career choices, and so I wanted to kind of highlight that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share um, with you, and we'll walk through this presentation. Again, it's not uh, terribly long, um, but hopefully it's informative. So let me know when you, when you can all see. Hopefully, yep. you guys can see We can the, see it. Yep, it's working. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right. So what is a medical legal death investigator? Uh, essentially, again, it's a person whose role is to investigate death scenes specifically. Um, and those death scenes range, um, f I mean, from anything from uh, mostly traumatic deaths or unsupervised deaths, essentially. and in investigating the scene, you work directly with law enforcement. Most of the time, uh, typically you'll meet homicide investigators on scene um, or whomever's in charge of that uh, specific scene uh, when you arrive and you go from there. Um, we bridge the gap again between science uh, and medical science specifically and law enforcement and uh, provide specific details uh, on uh, death scenes and during the physical examination, we should be the foremost expert 
on anatomy uh, at the scene, essentially. So when a medical legal investigator arrives on the scene, essentially the decedent or um, the person who is there, the deceased person, uh, is my responsibility and my jurisdiction and under my, my control specifically while the crime scene itself is under law enforcement uh, jurisdiction and control. So you have to work uh, with law enforcement uh, directly during those circumstances. So what does a death investigator do? Um, essentially, we investigate any death that falls under jurisdiction of the medical examiner or coroner. And in addition, we perform uh, scene investigations and body examinations um, as well. So I'd like to point out that there are two systems in the United States, and one of those happens to be a medical examiner system when the other is a coroner system. And, and a lot of times I find people aren't familiar with the differences. And essentially to boil it down and simplify it, a medical examiner is the person in charge of uh, the medical examiner's office or the forensic science division uh, within a county, and they're responsible for determining cause and manner of death on all deaths that uh, fall under medical examiner jurisdiction. Um, but most importantly, they have to be a medical professional, they have to be a doctor or a pathologist. Uh, whereas a coroner is typically an elected official and does not have to have a medical background. But uh, there will be pathologists, forensic pathologists that work under the coroner. So they're not actually doing the autopsies. So who can become a medical legal death investigator? Uh, the answer is pretty simple, uh, anyone. Um, the requirements are typically not formal. And with that, what I'm specifically referring to is post-certification. Um, you do not need to be a law enforcement officer or go through law enforcement training to be a medical legal death investigator. However, an education is typically required um, at, with at least a bachelor's level, which I'll touch on a little bit uh, going forward. Um, but you should have medical knowledge, so any anatomy, uh, information or courses that you're able to obtain uh, are effective and helpful. Uh, criminal knowledge, uh, knowledge of the criminal justice system. You need deductive reasoning and uh, very good critical thinking skills because oftentimes things are not what they seem to be. And when you approach a, a death scene, you typically work from a homicide level uh, down um, as necessary, if that makes sense. So we treat everything as a homicide until we can prove that it isn't. So a lot of people ask me what degree is helpful, and um, the answer, again, is pretty simple. Uh, the bachelor's degree um, is a typical requirement. You can obtain the position with an associate's level degree in some cases, um, but the degrees that will help you and that are preferred are typically criminal justice degrees um, with uh, additional medical knowledge. So for example, my, my degrees are in uh, criminal justice management. Um, I have uh, several anatomy courses as well uh, that I've taken, including um, a forensic pathology and death investigation class that was uh, subsequently taught by uh, one of the uh, forensic pathologists that happens to work for the Pima Medical Examiner. Um, and um, in addition to that, typically when you become a death investigator, you're required within the first two years of employment or excuse me, the first year of employment to ascertain your delegate status with the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigators. And that's also known as the ABMDI. Um, so I am currently a delegate uh, with the Medical Legal Death Investigators um, Association. And what that requires is a lot of studying. It's a very long test. It's approximately four hours of testing. And it ranges from scene investigation to evidence um, procurement, um, chain of custody, um, and things of that nature. So it's, it's very intensive. And you know, once you pass, you get a diploma and a registry number, and that helps sort of identify you within the community. Medical legal death investigators are typically a very small force. In fact, I think there's roughly, don't quote me on this, but somewhere around the 2000 mark, only 2000 registered medical legal death investigators, I think, uh, exist in the U.S. and I think only New York requires you to be a PA level um, education. So 
the opportunities are there um, with the right education and knowledge. Uh, you can use the same skills to work for a coroner as you would a, a medical examiner. And all states and counties have them typically. Uh, Pima County is unique in regards to the jurisdiction uh, that we're responsible for, which is uh, typically most of Arizona, including um, the northern counties, all the southern counties, with the exception of a few, one including Maricopa County, who has their own medical examiner. So we do a lot of volume at the, at the county here in Pima. Um, so we're investigating uh, calls that not only pertain to uh, specifically Pima County, where we would go in a county mandated vehicle and investigate the scene with law enforcement. We're also doing cases that are being sent to us from other counties. And typically a sheriff's department or a police officer uh, will transport those individuals uh, down for examination and then transport them back after the examination has been complete. Another uh, great piece of information is that the uh, projected uh, job growth um, until 2028 is approximately 14% for forensic science positions. And I included this because it's, I think it's uh, great to sort of see where, where the, the career might take you. And the medium pay is, is really good too, uh, typically. Um, but being a medical legal death investigator is a great job to sort of break into that, uh, that type of career path with as well and you can it can lead to jobs with the sheriff's department jobs with the police department city police departments in in any type of forensic um, field that you that you might choose so it's a great way to open doors as well so a little bit about the scene um, typically a medical legal death investigator will arrive assist the scene um, immediately we begin taking photographs of uh, the home or location um, where we discover or the body was discovered, um, things like the address, um, the front of the home. Um, that way we can ascertain the, the, the situation a little bit more thoroughly uh, through, through photographs. And essentially with photography, you want to make sure that you are presenting and telling a story very clearly with the photograph. So a typical case would be comprised of photographs that you should literally be able to see the first photograph and walk yourself through the story as you move through the photography. Um, we also look for any obvious signs of trauma. So for example, if I'm building a case report, uh, it might say something like, you know, the decedent is a 63 year old male with probable, or, or excuse me, with a history to include COPD. Um, obvious signs of trauma are located on uh, the decedent's face and upper torso, for example, something like that. Um, so we look for obvious signs of trauma immediately, and that includes the body examination. We palpate the skull, um, uh, occipital, temporal uh, regions, um, the parietal regions, make sure that there's no um, injury there, uh, which is co very common with uh, self-inflicted gunshot wounds, um, for example, or traumatic injuries that include blunt force, which, I, again, I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, but we look for things like rigor mortis, uh, liver mortis, um, the stages of decomposition and specific injuries to determine uh, basically a storyline and uh, try to arrive at some sort of conclusion about what the perceived uh, manner of death is uh, for every specific case. So some of the things that we also look for for postmortem changes, which I've already mentioned a little bit, but body temperature um, would be inclusive in a, in a scene that was very, very um, young in terms of uh, death, whereas a lot of times the temperature is really um, only going to be relevant uh, if you're at a scene, you know, for example, in Arizona, if someone uh, passes away at home and they are not discovered for a few days or a few weeks, um, the air conditioning was left off, it can become very hot uh, inside a home. Or conversely, if they've left the air conditioning on and the temperature is roughly around 70 degrees, for example, that's going to affect the nature of decomposition greatly. And that can help us determine a rough estimate on when um, you know, they were last seen or when they may have become deceased. And ultimately, 
Uh, I'd like to point out that there's really no way to tell the exact time of death. We don't do liver temperature. Um, it's not like CSI on TV. We don't have, you know, touch screens all over the place and immediate toxicology reports to tell. So that's kind of one of those rumors I like to dispel a little bit with that. But we also look for uh, insect or animal activity. Um, and when the decedent was last seen, um, were they a heavy smoker? Um, did they have poor eating habits? Were they extremely healthy? Um, were they on medications? That's very important. Uh, things that'll tell us, kind of uh, give us a little bit of a timeline to establish things like receipts, uh, documentation, mail, uh, newspapers, you know, the, the, the environment that they're located in and, and things like that uh, ultimately help us uh, build that case report. So there's something called a window of death. Um, some of the variables um, that I've uh, mentioned all, uh, already. Um, when were they last known to be alive? We can discover that information from neighbors. Uh, if they frequent specific stores, if I go to someone's home and they frequent in a specific Domino's pizza, for example, for the last you know, year, um, I can tell you know, maybe the, the employees are, are aware of this person and they know when his last order was or dated receipts. Um, are very important when, when was the last time they made a purchase. Um, are the lights on or off? Um, I always like to assess that to see uh, if it sort of matches uh, behavioral patterns. And pets, a very good indicator uh, of a timeline. Um, you can establish a timeline based on um, the average time, you know, that um, you know, pets may, may have not eaten. Um, have the pets consumed any of the decedent? Um, how many pets are there? You know, and then bill cycles. Have they not paid their bills in a month? Has it been two months? Has it been a year? Um, things like that are very helpful um, to determine kind of the nature and timeline. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the stages of decomposition. I probably won't get too uh, in-depth with that. Um, but we have a fresh death. Um, next comes bloat, active decay, advanced decay, and dry remains. Um, there's a lot of things going on with the body uh, during this time. Um, so it's important to know the stages of decomposition. And that is uh, ultimately probably one of the best ways to tell um, or establish a timeline depending on your environment. So if the, if the, the body was found um, outdoors versus indoors, you know, the environment plays a huge role on how the body's impacted as far as autolysis and the decomposition process is concerned. So what does death look like? A lot of times people equate death or the view of death or the deceased to um, TV movies, uh, but it's very different uh, in real life. And some people, most people have had experience with death, you know, uh, unfortunately family members pass or friends or, or things like that. But uh, for me and my experience, the um, responsibility, I guess, of going to scenes and sort of encompassing different aspects of a decedent, how they lived, what kind of things were they were going through their minds, you know, reading journals, um, what kind of habits they have. You really get to know these people individually, so it becomes more important for you to sort of speak for them uh, since they can't anymore. And I took that responsibility um, very seriously. And for me, it, again, life-changing experience is very humbling. So uh, a lot of circumstances that you find with medical legal death investigation because of the, the nature of jurisdiction uh, or the requirements involved uh, violent or traumatic deaths or unsupervised deaths are typically homicides and suicides. <clears throat> uh, those can include blunt force trauma, um, which if you're not familiar with blunt force, essentially we're thinking in terms of you know crowbars, bats, tire irons, blunt force, um, very, um, very damaging trauma. So it's, it's pretty obvious when you see it. Uh, in, in addition, you have sharp force trauma and gunshot trauma. Uh, sharp force meaning anything with a, a, any bladed object, um, but you can have a variety of different wounds, you know, uh, with sharp force. And gun tra trauma finally is is uh, typically obvious, but in some cases not obvious. So sometimes 
with small caliber weapons, it takes some time to find the, uh, the initial uh, entry wound or exit wound there, depending on where they're located on the body. And then suicide um, also includes a lot of gunshot trauma. You see a lot of overdose and a lot of incised wounds, which are made by very sharp objects. Um, and then one thing that uh, I didn't place in here was uh, hanging uh, trauma. So those are some things that you can expect to see uh, as far as circumstances uh, go. And here are some pictures for you. Uh, so on the left, you can see examples of uh, stab wounds or sharp force trauma. Uh, these uh, are both very common uh, things that you encounter in death investigation. Uh, you have an incised wound uh, with a very wide middle area. You can see how it's very uniform and there's no bridging uh, or, or a tissue connecting between the two points uh, in the middle and then you have tailing. There we have on the bottom right, you can see some gunshot wound trauma. Uh, from looking at those wounds, you can tell that they aren't uh, terribly close. There's no stippling, uh, residue, or burning. And there's also no imprints on there, so you can tell a little bit about the distance that the uh, person was uh, fired upon from. Uh, and also, you can, you can clearly count the wounds. Um, these look like posterior gunshot wounds uh, to me, just by looking at a little bit of the picture. Um, so you can see that several of them anatomically um, you know, appear to be very damaging. And then finally, blunt force trauma. Uh, here you can see that this person uh, was hit with something very blunt, uh, not, uh, nothing bladed. And uh, it looks like um, they were hit um, on multiple occasions. Uh, so you can kind of tell the difference between the wounds and see the different impact that you may encounter um, when you're looking at a body. And that way you can sort of determine and build a timeline and circumstantial uh, narrative in your, in your mind while you're conducting scene investigation. So I included this um, just to uh, wrap up a little bit. There's a, a multitude of skills and requirements um, that sort of pertain to law enforcement and investigation, as well as the scientific aspect and medical aspect of medical legal investigation. Some of those things um, include, uh, you know, digital multimedia knowledge, uh, biological knowledge, you know, um, physics, and then of course the crime scene and death investigation. Uh, some of the things I, I didn't mention that are also included in my original PowerPoint are things like anthropology, forensic anthropology, or the scientific um, evaluation of bones and bone structure, which can tell you, uh, you know, a multitude of things about a deceased individual. Um, we deal with fires, um, fire deaths, motor vehicle accidents. Um, you know, toxicology is a huge portion of what we do because Ultimately, and I've had cases personally where, you know, the individual that was deceased was uh, presented laying in bed and they were, uh, they appeared healthy, had great eating habits, exercised regularly, and had no uh, predetermined medical conditions and were still deceased in their early 30s. And, you know, you can't see an overdose typically um, in some cases. There are um, red flags and, and physical markers. Uh, that you can that you can see visually, you know, to help you, you know, help you down that path. But ultimately, toxicology is huge because it'll tell you down to the nanogram what kind of chemicals were located within the individual system at the time of death. And it'll also give you an idea of the things that they were using. Was it a multitude of, uh, you know, drugs? Was it polysubstance abuse with alcohol and drugs? Uh, you know, the combination. Different drugs produce different chemicals. For example, um, cocaine and alcohol produce something called cocaethylene, which is far more toxic than either of the two um, not combined. And sometimes that can lead to certain complications. Uh, so it's important to know what you're looking for um, in terms of toxicology. I've had cases where people have overdosed on Benadryl or over-the-counter sleeping Tylenol. Um, just such mass quantities of that particular drug um, that they 
uh, expired from that. And then ultimately, too, some things that people think are, are essentially harmless or don't know much about can, can affect uh, overdose as well, um, you know, like aspirin, for example. Um, too much aspirin really causes liver failure. I think it's 4,000 milligrams uh, on a daily basis that your liver can tolerate. Anything past that will be, become toxic. And so you combine that with a, you know, chronic alcohol abuse and you have a recipe for disaster. So it's a lot, a lot of things that go into it, a lot of skills. And the reason I mention this is because most people have some work experience that can contribute to the knowledge and expertise that they need to work themselves into a position like death investigation or medical legal death investigation. Anybody have any questions? I do. Uh, the the one was that buckshot or was that just multiple rounds? Um, to me, I, I can't say uh, for certain uh, because obviously I didn't investigate the case or I wasn't there. But to me, it appears uh, to be multiple rounds uh, from a, a handgun or rifle. Uh, buckshots typically uh, has a different pattern and with smaller uh, entry. Mm -hmm. Typically, as well with buckshot, depending on the the range, uh, you won't have uh, exit wounds, uh, unless they're bilateral or sort of bridging, uh, through like uh, shallow portions of skin or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chris, um, Sasha doesn't, um, her sound isn't working. I mean, uh, Mike isn't working. She's asking how closely do death investigators work with prosecutors in criminal charges related to homicides? That's a good question. As far as the investigation is concerned, uh, the contact between prosecution and or uh, the court system is, is uh, typically limited in that regard. Your, what's important to understand is that your case and your case narrative will see the courtroom. However, the forensic pathologist that is conducting the physical autopsy is typically the person that goes to court to represent the medical uh, examiner's office. So they will take your case report, your initial case report, scrutinize the scene uh, report and the examination report uh, that you have. And then it gets added to the autopsy report, which completes the case file, which is then presented to the court uh, for evidence. So you, as a medical legal death investigator, actually play a huge role in how the court process is affected um, in terms of your narrative and the, the way that you present the case and the evidence and your scene observations. Um, but as far as going to court physically, typically the investigator, in some cases you do go to court, but uh, as an investigator, you typically won't go to court and sit on a stand, if, that's the, if that helps answer the question. The, the doctor or forensic pathologist that does the autopsy is typically the, the person representing that and will, will be the expert witness, if you will. Sasha, does that answer your question pretty well? Perfect. Yes, awesome. Um, yes, I have to admit during your presentation, which by the way was fantastic, Chris, um, I could not watch parts of it. <laughs> I had yeah, to walk away from the screen and just listen <laughs> because this is not my specialty. I cannot handle this stuff. That's, but I'm glad there are people in this world like you that can. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you, it was a, a big shock uh, to the system at first because I've had some experiences in life, um, you know, where I was kind of close to that subject matter, but never have I, before I had become a death investigator, had I, you know, actively been around uh, so much uh, death, I guess, in, in that regard. And so it was a, before my first case or before my training cases that I went to, you know, there are certain things, sort of, uh, you know, bridge marks that you look, that you that you're excited for, but also kind of nervous about. You know, one is, you know, your first case. Obviously, your first scene is is very intimidating, um, and it's very heavy. And I think that you can't really grasp the concept of it until you experience it. Um, but then, then you have things like decomposition cases. You know, your first deco decomposed body um, is a big um, 
you know, it's a big marker there in your career because, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of people get excited for this job and they're, they're gung ho and they're ready to knock it out. And in the first decomp case they have, they leave their boots under their desk and say sayonara and they're out. And that's understandable. So it really takes somebody with a strong mind and a, and a strong, you know, sense of uh, purpose and, and willpower to go in there and, and handle the, the, you know, the pressure of a scene, you know, and you can do it. Um, you, you can either do it or you can't do it. And that's, you know, that's either way is uh, it's fine, you know, but that's something to consider, you know, it's, it's a very uh, noble job. And that's why I took it so seriously and why I was so proud of, uh, being a part of that um, because I felt unique in that regard. It made me feel empowered to help people that were unable to help themselves um, typically. And I could, I could write a, a good case narrative and a good report and provide great information for doctors and lawyers and the legal system and police, you know, to help people uh, going forward when they couldn't help themselves anymore. So, you know, I understand what you're saying uh, or what you mean by that. And, and unfortunately the, the photographs that I presented are, are very um, modest compared to what you run into in the field. Um, but like I'm I said, sorry, did, did you just say that unfortunately they are modest? No, I just meant the, uh, they're not something that you would see. Uh, you would see much worse things. Maybe my wording was, um, incorrect but what I meant is that you would these are kind of a light uh, introduction to certain things that you would see in the field and by unfortunate I mean that they happen at all I got mean, it you know these people a lot of times people that you see are you know they they um, expire under uh, you know unfortunate circumstances they expire for you know mental health reasons or they're a victim of a crime and you know it's 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 very heavy in terms of um you know kind of dealing with the more you you delve you drill down into a case the more familiar you become uh, with that individual so they're not just a another number you know not just another person that you they that you don't know anymore you know their names you know their first name you know their last name you know where they like to go for dinner, you know who their mom and dad is, you know, they have brothers and sisters, you know, so you kind of, you really get to know these people. So, you know, it can affect you emotionally if you, if you allow it to. I can imagine that's tough. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so Chris, in the beginning, you mentioned unsupervised death. Mm -hmm. can, can you clarify that? What is it unsupervised? You mean, you mean like a death that didn't happen in the hospital? Or... Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're actually right on point with that. Typically, I mean, it could mean a hospital. It could mean, you know, a, a, a hospice environment, typically, where someone has been diagnosed with, you know, advanced stages uh, of cancer or, you know, something um, pertaining to them being in hospice care. And if a doctor is supervising, so you have, um, to, to clarify, it gets, try, to try and to explain this and not complicate it too much, you have uh, an unsupervised death would be any death that doesn't occur in a hospice environment or a medical facility. But you also have different types of supervised deaths too. And some of those need to be investigated like any medical malpractice or malfeasance that uh, happens uh, in a hospital. So if a doctor, you know, leaves a, a clamp or something, sews a clamp up into a patient and, you know, they subsequently pass because of complications due to that, that would be something that we would have to investigate. But if somebody has advanced stages, you know, of, of a cancer or something aggressive like that, or, or if they've been supervised for a specific amount of time in the hospital, then typically when they call, they all have to call the medical examiner to get clearance. Um, but we can decline jurisdiction on certain cases if they meet specific requirements. So if somebody has a, a lengthy medical history and a doctor is willing to sign the death certificate, typically we'll decline jurisdiction. You still have to create a case report for it, but we wouldn't go to the scene, uh, you know, the hospital or, or the hospice and, uh, investigate the scene or transport them. Typically we would just call and they would be transported, you know, to a funeral service that their family chooses. And that eliminates 
us as the middlemen and uh, you know the family can grieve appropriately a lot of times these processes take you know several uh, hours or days to complete and you know waiting for toxicology can be up to two weeks um, so sometimes the medical examiner will have to house uh, individuals for that length of time before we can release them because we need to make sure the evidence is complete and that can cause you know some some issues as far as you know burial and funeral services and things like that but we work uh, really closely with funeral services uh, hospice facilities um, the public fiduciary and the hospitals you know to kind of bridge those gaps but yeah there's different cases and you know, ultimately, if we decline jurisdiction, it's based on um, uh, written medical history, things that we can document. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So I'm going to assume that there are not. Um, I have added some contact information um, on the screen here. Um, again, if, you, uh, if any of you are interested in pursuing this career field um, and are looking for um, you know, the, uh, the best college to, um, to get that at, you're, you're, you're talking to it here. That's Brookline College. Christopher K. is actually in charge of our criminal justice program. Obviously, he has extensive knowledge <clears throat> that he shares with all of the students within his program. Um, you can contact us at this phone number, the 520-584-5200, or email us info at brooklinecollege.edu, and just be sure to mention the Tucson campus um, in that email, and we will certainly get you more information, especially about uh, that large scholarship that is available. Um, so thank you all for attending. Christopher, thank you for your expertise and sharing this with our community so that they can learn and understand more um, about this field. And uh, if anybody has any more questions, even for Chris, you can certainly still use that contact information and we can get a hold of Chris to, to answer those questions. Other than that, everybody, uh, thank you again for attending and please be safe out there. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher.